Looking at the 14th chapter of Leviticus, the first couple of verses, we find a very interesting passage. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. The 13th chapter of Leviticus deals with the subject of this loathsome disease of leprosy. In the 13th chapter, there were instructions for the priest on how to diagnose, to determine whether or not a person had leprosy. And if it was a determined that a person did have leprosy, then he was to be ostracized from the camp of Israel. He had to move out from his family, his home. He had to move out of the camp and he had to live outside of the camp. He could not have any type of uh, contact with other people. In fact, when people were approaching him, he would have to cry out, unclean, unclean. And thus leprosy was one of the most feared and loathsome of all diseases. It was up until just a few years ago that around the world there were what they call leper colonies where people who had leprosy would go to live together, to be treated. In the United States, we have a city that is designated for people who have leprosy. In Carville, Louisiana, a city that is made up of people with leprosy where they live together, they have their own really city back there, their own newspaper and all, and uh, are, are living together isolated from other people within the community. It is no longer called leprosy, but it is named now after Dr. Hansen, who was able to isolate the uh, leprosy bacillus. So it is now called Hansen's disease in order to uh, remove it from the horrible stigma that the word leprosy has always uh, had within a person's mind. And so now they refer to it after Dr. Hansen as the Hansen's disease. But to the present time, it remains an incurable disease. Now in looking at leprosy within the scripture, it has often been likened unto sin so that we say that leprosy is a type of sin or typical of sin. First of all, in the origin of the disease, how do you contract leprosy? How is it transmitted from one person to another? And the answer is, we don't know. The transmission of leprosy from one to another is a mystery of science. How does a person get leprosy? We don't know that. Many of the doctors dedicated to the research on leprosy, trying to find out more about this disease, have injected live leprosy bacillus into their own bodies to try to see if they can transmit leprosy by direct contact and they've not been able to do so. But suddenly a person has a breaking out uh, uh, on their skin, on their hand or, uh, or whatever and, and their fingers and they, they don't know what it is. And uh, suddenly you discover the doctor says you have Hansen's disease. How did you get it? We don't know. We don't know the method by which it's transmitted from one to another. So with sin, how is it that all of men have been infected with sin? That we don't know. We do know that by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, so that death passed unto all men for all sin. But how is it that it was passed on? The mystery by which sin was passed on to all of us, that we cannot tell, that we do not know. And so... Leprosy is much like sin in its origin within our own nature. How it comes to pass, we have no understanding. 
But then its effect upon a person who has been afflicted with it is very similar also to sin. Now leprosy usually begins by attacking the extremities of your body, usually your fingers and your toes. And the first thing that leprosy does is that it kills the nerves. So that leprosy is a completely painless disease. But that is one of the insidious parts of leprosy. In killing the nerves, the greatest danger to a leper is that of extreme burns or cutting themselves and never knowing it. They could put their hand right in a fire and never realize it because the nerves have all been destroyed by leprosy and thus there's a deadening of the nerves and a total unre- uh, un, uh, there is a total lack of realization of pain, fire or whatever else. Now quite often in, in times past you would see a person who was a leper, they would be a very gruesome sight because they would be missing maybe a hand and there'd be just a nub here or maybe even missing their arms up to their elbows and slowly eroding, eating away from their fingers or from their toes until it would eat their legs and all until it finally hit a vital part of their body and then they would die. And they usually looked very gruesome indeed and there were horrible misconceptions about leprosy. People thought that the the leprosy would eat the fingers and the fingers would maybe drop off or your hand would drop off. Not so. That isn't the way it works. In fact, the latest theories that they have concerning the absence of the hands and arms and so forth of a leprous person, the absence of their feet, the latest theories is that living as they did in these horrible conditions once they were diagnosed a leper and placed in these leper colonies and living in these uh, horrible conditions, that they feel that the people at night, the rats would come and eat their toes off or eat their feet off because the leprosy had deadened their senses Uh, Their nerves had killed the nerves so that they had no sense of pain so they didn't really realize what was happening to them as they were sleeping. They didn't feel it at all because there was no sense of of touch or pain whatsoever. And, And that's the latest theory of why they were actually missing fingers and hands and so forth because of the leprosy. A horrible progressive disease that continues to progress destroying the uh, nerves and so forth and, and finally hitting the vital parts of your body to kill you. Now, it is in that sense a type of sin also because one of the insidious things about sin is the first thing that it attacks and destroys is your willpower to resist. And soon you become totally hardened to your sinful actions. The first time you did it, man, was it hard. You thought about it for a long time. You resisted. You knew you shouldn't. But finally, under peer pressure or dare or whatever, you went ahead and said, well, I'll do it once. And you did it once. And in doing it once, a certain part of your willpower was deadened. So that the next time, of course, afterwards you had that horrible pangs of conscience, that horrible feeling of guilt, the idea and the thought, I'll never do that again. Oh, that's horrible. Why did I do that? And and all of these pangs of conscience. But the next time, your resistance wasn't quite as great. It was a little easier to do the second time than it was the first time because a part of your willpower had been deadened and destroyed. So you did it the second time. 
You didn't feel quite so bad afterwards. After all, you've already done it before. And again, a little bit more of your will to resist was destroyed. So the third time, it was even easier yet. The fourth time, easier and easier until finally you were able to do it without even a pang of conscience. As the Bible says, your conscience was seared as with a hot iron. The Bible speaks of the people who are beyond feeling. In other words, you can sin with impunity. You don't even feel it anymore. We talk about cold-blooded murderers. Men who can kill without any remorse, without any pity, without any feeling. Just totally feelingless. Doing such horrible things. And so it is possible as sin begins to take its hold upon your life, destroying your power and will to resist, that finally one day you wake up to the fact that you're trapped. I don't want to do it anymore. I see what it is doing to me. It's destroying me. It's destroying my relationships. It has cut me off from my family, from the ones I love but I have no power to resist anymore. That has been destroyed. And I find myself now trapped in the victim of that sin. Leprosy is also a type of sin in that leprosy, even to the present day, remains incurable. Despite the years of research, They have not been able to find a cure for leprosy. All they can do now is by medicine treat it so that they can arrest its progression. So if you should go to the doctor and he should say, well, I'm sorry, you have Hansen's disease, they would send you back to Carville, Louisiana for treatments and there through the treatments your leprosy could be arrested so that it would not progress any further in your body, but there is no cure for leprosy. And so with sin, outside of divine intervention, outside of a miracle or a work of God, there's no cure. There's no hope for the sinner. Now the fact that there is no cure for leprosy makes the 14th chapter, the first verse of Leviticus, very interesting indeed. For in this verse we read, And God spake unto Moses, saying, Now this is the law of the leper in the day that he is cleansed. Wait a minute. There is no cure for leprosy. And yet, God made provisions for the leper the day that he was cleansed. So that in the law, God left a loophole for him to work by his grace. God left within the law that opportunity for him to divinely intervene in hopeless cases. And to restore a person from that helpless, hopeless state. God left in the law room for him to work by divine intervention. I love it. In the law, there is a beautiful demonstration of God's grace because he made room for him to work that the leper who had been an outcast might be restored into the camp of God when God had worked a divine miracle within his life. And so this is the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. How beautiful indeed. For that which was incurable and impossible by man can be accomplished by the grace of God. And this is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. 
that which is incurable and impossible by man. The ridding of yourself from your sin. The freeing of yourself from its power. The delivering of yourself from its guilt and its effect. That which is impossible by man has been made possible by the grace of God. You can be forgiven. You can be restored. You can have restored fellowship with God's people, with the family of God. You can be brought back through that intervention of God by His glorious grace. God can give to you the power and the victory over the grip that sin has upon your life. Now it is interesting to me that the word cleansed is used concerning the leper rather than cured. This is the law of the leper in the day that he is cleansed. And all the way through the scripture with leprosy, we never find it referred to the leper being healed or the leper being cured, but always to the leper being cleansed. And so with sin, the term cleansed is also used. You're not cured of sin, you're cleansed from sin. And that cleansing the idea of washing and making clean, the obliterating through the cleansing. This is the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. First of all, a fellow is outside of camp. He's living with maybe a company of two or three other lepers. They haven't been able to touch their family in a long time. If their family members come to visit them, they have to stand so far away and they they sort of yell at each other to communicate. Hasn't been able to embrace his children or his wife for a long time. He can't touch anybody because he's unclean. And so this is the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. When he realizes that something has changed, the skin is no longer that rotten white, but it is now restored in a pinkish, fresh color to it. And he watches day after day and there's no more progression. The whiteness of the rotten flesh is gone and it seems like his skin is restored. He sends someone in to say to the priest, come out and take a look at me. And the priest comes out and he examines him and he pronounces him clean. He is then to bring to the priest two birds. And the priest takes a clay basin and he kills one of the birds over the clay basin as they are pouring water over the top of it. And then he takes the little hyssop hyssop bush, puts it in this bloodied water, and he sprinkles the man seven times. Then he takes the second bird, and he immerses it in this bloodied water. And then he sets the second bird free, and it flies away with the bloodied water sprinkling off of its wings. Can you imagine what emotions must have gone through that person as he watched that bird flying away, the water splattering from its wings? And he realized, I'm clean, I'm restored. I can go home to my family. I can sit at the table and eat with them. I can hug my children. I can kiss my wife. I'm restored. I'm healed. I'm cleansed. What an emotion he must have felt as that bird was flying away. And he realized, 
the work of God's grace in restoring his life. Yes, I can imagine his feelings. I have experienced them. Of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse me of my guilt, to restore me to the family of God, to deliver me from the power of sin, and to give me a whole new life in him. A leprous man one day came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you will, you could make me clean. The scripture said, and Jesus touched him. Wait a minute, Jesus, that's against the law. You're not to touch a leprous man. And yet, Jesus touched him and immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy so Jesus was no longer committing an unlawful deed. The touch of Jesus was all it took. The Bible tells us that when Jesus was crucified a soldier put the spear into his side and there came forth blood and water. The Bible also tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses a man from all sin. That which was impossible for man, that which is incurable by man's standards, yet God made provision for him to work above and beyond the abilities of man to work by his divine grace. And that which is true of leprosy is true of your sin. And if you come to Jesus today, just let Him touch you and He can restore your life and restore you to the family of God. Shall we pray? Father, we thank You for the touch that made us whole that cleansed us from all of our sin and unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that you were willing to reach out and touch us in our hour of distress and despair. Thank you for what that touch has done to our lives. Thank you for the power that you have given us over sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken people, ruined lies are why you died on Calvary. Your touch is what I long for. You have given life to me. May the Lord be with you and watch over you through the week. May you experience the touch of God's power and grace upon your life. If you find, if you find yourself today sort of bound, enslaved by sin, Know this, God has made provision for you. And you can experience today the forgiveness of God. The joy that David spoke about when he said, Oh, how happy is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. You can know God's power over sin. 
you can know the victory of Jesus Christ in your life today, I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room and meet with the pastors and let them pray with you. The prayer room is over here on your far right. Now may the Lord watch over you. May the good hand of our Lord be upon your life that you might experience more and more His love, His grace, His goodness that He wants to pour out upon you because He loves you so much. May the blessings of the Lord attend your life all through the week. In Jesus' name.